Go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hi, my name is Angeline Marks, and I'm playing National Guardsman Leon Smith. My name is Carolyn Smith, and I'm playing protester Mary Vichicho. And I'm Lindsay Callahan, and I'm playing President Richard M. Nixon, and we're doing a performance of Four Dead in Ohio. <laughs> The Kent State Massacre for its nation to reform its politics in Vietnam. Pigs off campus! Pigs off campus! Pigs off campus! Hi, my name is Mary Bacicho, and I ran away from home to help with a revolution that could help change the world. I didn't want to sit at home and watch what many called the living room war on television. The average age of an American soldier in Vietnam was 19, most of which didn't want to be there but were forced to be there because of the draft. And did you hear? President Nixon called us bums. Can you believe that? He's the bum. He's the one who said that he was going to decrease the number of troops in Vietnam, only to increase the number of troops by invading Cambodia. At the protest, two students threw lit flares into an army ROTC building on campus and burnt it to the ground. But eventually, things began to calm down, and the army men began to mingle with the students. The whole thing felt more like a backyard barbecue rather than a protest. But then things began to change. Rocks were flying, tear gas was thrown, and worst of all, gunshots were fired. <laughs> called the National Guard and I to the campus because he felt that the riots were getting out of control. At first, things were going fine. Some, some girls were handing out flowers. Then students started to throw rocks at us. We were provoked. General Canterbury gave one of the other guardsmen a bullet hole and tell the students to disperse, saying it was an order and they must leave immediately. When the, we got the order to throw the tear gas, um, I thought to myself, we don't be in Vietnam to be in a war. I heard some of the other guardsmen around me complaining that somebody's being killed. By the time, we didn't know what would happen. When the students started doing the chance to gas back at us, we moved top of hill to wait for orders. Then we started to shoot. Maybe 16 rounds altogether. I'm not sure. It was about noon, but it was all over real fast. Then the screaming started. I didn't know what was going on when the gunshots were fired until I saw my friend Jeffrey Miller lying face down on the ground. He had been shot dead. I just fell to the ground and started crying and screaming. I didn't know what else I could do. I later found out that my that a friend that I had met along the way at one of the protests, Sandra Schuer, had also been killed. She was so pretty and inspiring. She didn't care about the fact that I was only 14 like some of the others did. She was so pretty and inspiring. Didn't care about. I just hope that their deaths don't go unnoticed. I have to hope that by their lives ending, it'll help this country for the better. I do not think that anyone who heard my comments at the Pentagon, or who heard the tape recording of it, had any doubt that when I referred to the bombs burning up the books and blowing up the campuses, I was referring to the arsonists at Kent State, Berkeley, Yale, and bombers like them. The Washington Post accurately reflected my meaning. Nixon denounces campus bums who burn books, set off bombs. However, the front page headline of the New York Times conveyed a slightly different meaning. Nixon puts bums label on some college radicals. Within a few days, it was a widespread impression I referred to all student protesters as bums. The media coverage and interpretation of the bum statement added fuel to the fires of dissent already getting out of control on many campuses. The National Student Association called for my impeachment, and editors from 11 Eastern colleges ran a common editorial in their campus newspapers calling for a nationwide academic strike. On Monday, May 4th, I was discussing my schedule with my sister, Haley. He seemed agitated and said, something just came over the wires about the demonstration at Kent State. The National Guard opened fire and some students were shot. I was stunned. I then asked if they were dead and he responded, I'm afraid so. No one knows why it happened. Once I received the names of the injured students, I wrote personal letters to each of the families, even though I knew words couldn't help. However, I had to stand by my choices of warfare, for I had taken a new approach to the war when I gained the presidency where I created the program of Vietnamization, where I steadily removed the number of U.S. ground troops while still training the South Vietnamese to defend their own. However, at the same time, I escalated the U.S. airways over North Vietnam, bombing their supply and infiltration routes to Cambodia. But when this action failed, I decided to invade Cambodia. By doing this, I had planned to use Cambodia as a bargaining tool to end the Vietnam War. 
I didn't think things would escalate to where they did, to the point where I was criticized for bringing the war home. But I knew there would be both military and political risks. And since I took those risks, I do assume full responsibility for them. And I can say it was one of the worst events of my presidency. On May 7, 1974, eight of the guards were put on trial for what had happened. Robert Murphy was the prosecutor. His argument was that there was no massive rush of student towards the guardsmen, no student within 60 feet, and in fact, only two of the 13 people shot were shot in the front. During the trial, he called 33 witnesses to the stand, including nine <laughs> injured protesters, which each testified that the National Guardsmen did no harm. Together, the eight guardsmen on trial had two defense attorneys. C.D. Lambros defended guardsmen Pierce, Zoller, and Morris, and Baron Stavinsky defended guardsmen Schaefer, Perkins, McManus, and McGee, and I was defended by Ed Wright. The three defense attorneys all agreed in the same argument, in which they portrayed the crowd as frenzied rioters, and that they, they were not... Con they were not con exercising their legitimate constitutional rights. They also blamed Governor Rhodes, the university administrators, and our commanding officer for placing us in vulnerable positions in the first place. But the prosecution took the statements of the National Guardsmen previously stated that they aimed directly at the students. The defense tried to poke holes in the credibility of the witnesses with contradicting statements. One of the witnesses that testified for the prosecution became one of the best for the defense. His name was John Clear, and he was one of the injured students in the riots. On trial, he was confronted with statements he had given to the FBI in 1970. He had said that the guardsmen looked very panicked, and the rocks the students had thrown at them were as large as softballs. But on trial, he claimed that he had been under medication at the time, and now, four years later, his memory was better. On that same day, Judge Battisti had told Robert Murphy to have an argument ready, because if the, defen if the defense attorneys asked for a direct acquittal, he would most likely grant it. This put Murphy in a tough position because Battisti had basically made up his mind, and it was now the prosecution's job to convince Battisti that the National Guardsmen were guilty. The next day, November 8, 1974, Murphy introduced his final exhibits, including a tape, re tape recording of the shootings uh, made by a Kent State University student, Terry Strew. Murphy considered this to be the most important piece of evidence. He also had a sample of the types of rifles used at the shooting, and a look at the previous statements made by the guardsmen on trial. On that day, in 1974, the defense asked the judge to, to dismiss the case due to lack of evidence. The prosecutor was unable to gain the specific objective that Batisti was looking for, and the guardsmen were acquitted. After the trial, many people questioned Murphy's and the Justice Department's intent, for it seemed that they were just going through the motions to seem like they were trying. But in reality, Murphy's superior, Attorney General John Mitchell, had opposed the trial to begin with. People began to think a conspiracy had occurred, because Murphy did not use all the evidence that was available to him. In the FBI report, which he helped to write, it said that there were that six guardsmen testified that their lives were not in danger and that it had not been a shooting situation. Out of those six, there were one captain and two sergeants, but yet Murphy did not call any of them to the witness stand. One, gu one of the guardsmen anonymously said to the Knights newspaper that, I just closed my eyes and shot towards the crowd. He admitted that he did not feel as if he had to save his life, but that it was an automatic thing. Everybody shot, so I shot. Now the guys have been saying that we got to stick to the same story and say that it was our lives in danger and a matter of survival. Murphy knew that the only guardsman who gave a similar story was Ralph Zoller, but he said Zoller had given different, a different account to the FBI and he was unable to prove that the anonymous man was Zoller. But some people did believe that Robert Murphy really did try his best. Pat Shea, the investigator for the House Judiciary Subcommittee that pressured the Justice Department into its investigation, said that it was clear that Murphy wanted to pursue, wanted to pursue the evidence vigorously. David Engill, one of the defense attorneys for the, family, for the families of the slain students, reported that Murphy was frustrated over Batiste's decision. He believed that the guards had lied to the FBI to protect themselves. Murphy also felt disadvantages. He was only able to interrogate James McGee, one of the seven guardsmen on trial, because the others had pled the fifth. Also, there were multiple defense attorneys at the trial, and they each got to give their defense <coughs> separately, which meant that the defense had three times the amount to give their argument than Murphy did to give the prosecution. John Thielo was a senior and photography major at Kent State in 1970. On May 4th, he decided to go and see the riots. He had hoped to use his camera to capture memorable photos from, from the protests. He took the um, famous photograph of Mary Ruchicho kneeling over the body of slain student Jeffrey Miller. Later in 1970, he won a Pulitzer Prize for his picture. He also heard one of the students ask the guards why they had shot, and the guard responded with, first, and we'll shoot again. 
The reaction to our revolution was huge. Famous singers and songwriters composed songs specific to the events at Kent State, including Ohio by Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. Since the reaction was so big, it put pressure on Nixon to reform to get the troops out of Vietnam. In January of 1973, all the troops were finally removed. The revolution at Kent State caused a big enough reaction to force a reform. The lives of the four law students from May 4th, 1970 will never be forgotten.